Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for an exciting discussion about the challenges and also the unforeseen opportunities of filmmaking during the COVID pandemic. I'm excited to lead our fireside chat tonight with producers Clark Peterson, who in addition to producing Working Man, also produced the Oscar-winning film Monster, and Level Holder, who produced Working Man, as well as the indie romance, Some Freaks. Tonight, we'll be discussing their film Working Man, which stars Talia Shire, Peter Garrity, and Billy Brown. And Clark and Level will share the journey to produce the film and the challenges and silver lining of releasing it during the pandemic. So for those who've already seen the screening, Working Man deals, deals with powerful, timely issues, including unemployment and mental health issues. And if you haven't yet seen it, we'll be sharing a private screening link in our follow-up email. And tonight we'll be sharing the trailer and some of Clark and Lovell's favorite clips. But before we introduce our stars tonight, Clark and Lovell, I wanted to thank my co-hosts, Rob Walk and Pilar Castro-Kiltz. And thank you also to the Princeton Club of New York and our terrific co-sponsors, the Princeton Association of New York City, Princeton Alumni Association, the Princeton Club of Southern California, and Princeton in Hollywood. So tonight we're going to hear some really terrific insights about what it's like to release a movie during the pandemic and the surprising unexpected benefits that Lovell and Clark discovered. And we'll also be discussing this incredibly powerful film that's really met the moment in a way that Clark and Lovell could not have anticipated when they originally filmed Working Man in spring 2018. So some of the acclaimed reviews include, the Chicago Sun-Times has called Working Man quietly magnificent and deeply resonant. It's some of the most powerful acting seen in any movie this year. Variety has called it one of the best under the radar films of 2020. It's also been hailed by Deadline as a film that defines what smart independent filmmaking is all about. So to discuss Working Man and filming during the pandemic, I'm delighted to welcome producers Clark Peterson and Lovell Holder. A graduate of Stanford University, Clark Peterson is a film producer and entertainment executive based in LA. He produced the Academy Award winning film Monster Char starring Charlize Theron for which he won an Independent Spirit Award as well, and we'll be hearing a bit about that film later as well. And other recent films include Rampart with Woody Harrelson, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet with Salma Hayek and Liam Neeson, Ideal Home with Paul Rudd, and Devil's Knot with Reese Witherspoon and Colin Firth. He's married to television showrunner Stacey Ruckheiser, and the couple has two children. And as for Lovell, Lovell Holder graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Princeton University with a degree in English literature and a certificate in theater. He then went on to receive his master's in fine arts at Brown University Trinity Repertory Company. And after moving to LA, he worked as a development assistant for Clark and his wife, Stacy. Since that time, Level has produced Working Man, as well as the upcoming Bird Watching with Amanda Seyfried, Surrogate with Damien Chazelle, Some Freaks with Thomas Mann and Marin Ireland, and he was writer-director of Loserville with Matt McGorry and Darby Stanfield. And Level's work has been screened and garnered prizes at dozen, dozens of American and international film festivals. We're also going to have a wonderful cameo appearance tonight, as Rob mentioned, from Clark's wife, Stacy Ruckheiser, who's a Peabody and AFI award winner, showrunner of the Emmy-nominated drama Unreal, and she's currently in post-production as showrunner of the new Netflix series, Sex Life. 
And I have to say, we've got a tremendous opportunity to learn about the impact of film of the pandemic on films, because Lovell and Clark will be talking to us about what happens when a film is released during the pandemic. And Stacy will be able to share what it was actually like to have to film with all the COVID protocols in place. So as Rob mentioned, Clark and Lovell will speak for about an hour. We'll be showing four clips as well as the trailer. And then they'll answer questions for about 15 to 20 minutes. So just a reminder, please click on the Q&A tab, type your questions into the box and we will get to as many as we can. So before we start discussing the film itself, there's a very interesting story about Lovell and Clark's start in Hollywood and in the theater. I'd love to have the audience understand how you both met and how the arc of your career stories both rested on alumni internships. Level your internship with Clark and his wife Stacy Ruckheiser in 2010 was based on you and Stacy being Princeton grads. And Clark, you got your start with a fellow alum from Stanford. Level, why don't we start with you? And then Clark, we'd love to hear about the impact your internship had on your career in the film industry too. Sure, no, well, Wendy, thank you so much for such a warm introduction and to, to all the groups that are hosting us tonight. Um, yeah, it's it's been, uh, it's funny. I was thinking the other day that it's hard to believe that Clark and Stacy and I have now known each other over a decade because I started uh, interning for Clark and Stacy about a week after they were married in 2010. So we had been connected originally because uh, a neighbor in Charlotte, uh, the lovely Lee Levine, who's also the class of 91 along with Stacy, um, bumped into my mom in the supermarket um, at a time when I was setting out my summer plans for that year. And uh, she met, my mom mentioned to Lee that I was looking to be in LA and she connected me to Stacy and Stacy said, well, I actually don't need an assistant right now, but my, my fiance uh, might be interested. And so she connected me with Clark and we hit it off. And soon enough, I, I was in LA uh, as an intern and they actually had an assistant at the time, but the assistant quit two days after I arrived and Clark very kindly said, hey, I, I know you were brought here to be an intern, do you think you could be the assistant for the summer? And I very happily said yes. And it was one of the, the best experiences I could have ever had. Clark and Stacy have been tremendous mentors to me at every step of the way. That's great. And Clark, tell us about your story with the Stanford alum. Uh, absolutely. Uh, long before Lovell um, even thought about internships, I was uh, <laughs> graduating from Stanford and, uh, um, you know, as we all know, this business is a crazy business. It's, uh, there's no one path to getting in and um, you sort of have to just pull out all the stops and try to figure out how you can possibly, you know, get your foot in the door. So um, when I was uh, a senior, I, uh, I found out that there was a producer in Hollywood named Roger Corman, um, who at the time he was sort of known not so much for the quality of his films, but rather for the quantity. Um, and he's kind of a legendary guy in that he produced more films, I think, than anybody in the history of Hollywood. I, he's produced more than 500 films uh, now, but he was he was definitely legendary. He's also very well known for having discovered a number of big talents from, you know, Jim Cameron to uh, to Francis Coppola, and you know, the, the list is very long. Ron Howard, etc. Um, so I wrote him a letter back when we wrote letters and um, he, uh, he said, you know, one of the things he was making a lot of films at the time. And so what became very clear to me is he was very willing to have um, smart young people who would work for free um, come and help with his operation. He was also known for his frugality. Um, and so, um, yeah, I wrote to him and he offered me an internship and I, you know, I, I had actually grown up in Southern California, so I was able to come back down here and started an internship, and then worked for him for a while. Um, but it was that that intern that you know alumni connection that helped me. The other funny thing about Roger Corman, even though he's you know one of the most legendary film producers in Hollywood, um, he actually went to Stanford for engineering, and he got his degree in engineering, 
And then he uh, worked as an engineer for like six months and decided he had had enough of that. So he uh, decided to get into the film business. So anyways, it's again, it's a crazy business, but uh, that's how I got my foot in the door. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, meeting Lovell was, was amazing because uh, yes, I was in need of, of an intern. Um, and then several days later, I was in need of an assistant. And so uh, Lovell was, you know, has been amazing. And yeah, it's, it's been such a great story because he started out at that level, you know, working with us and, you know, now he and I are producing movies together and um, he and Stacy are even writing together. So um, it's been a great, a great story. What, what tremendous experiences. And as you said, it's so hard to break into the film industry. And it's really amazing that you both were able to do that by really building on your college experiences and reaching out to alumni. So it's a great lesson for, for people trying to break into the industry, pull out all the stops, reach out to your alums, and, uh, and then you can make a difference. It's a great story. So now, of course, let's talk about the film Working Man itself. And some in the audience may have seen the film. Uh, I'm hoping everybody will because it's amazing. But I thought to set it up, it would be great to show the trailer. So can, Level, can you set up the film a bit and then we'll break into the trailer? Sure, well, so Working Man uh, was written and directed by Robert Jury, um, a, a brilliant filmmaker who grew up in the Midwest um, in uh, this, a factory town alongside a river. And about 10 years ago, um, he started writing this story based on uh, a kind of what if that occurred to him about what would happen if a factory worker who'd worked at this factory his entire life, just kind of kept going to the job. And uh, he started writing that screenplay. And then what eventually developed is I think a very compelling portrait of grief and also how we come to accept loss and like living within the world and being able to move past things when they're no longer serving us, both in terms of the practicalities of life in terms of economic realities, but also the emotional struggles that come with mental illness um, and the loss of people whom we love very much. But the film stars Peter Garrity, Talia Shire, and Billy Brown. And um, yeah, we, we could not be prouder of it. Be home for supper. Two o'clock, same as full day. You're free to leave. Nick has put in half a day just to collect our last check. Look, I'm gonna be out of work the same as everybody else. Guy knows he's not getting overtime, right? Yeah, he knows. He's just been with the company a long time, is all. Well. Look, just make sure that he's gone before you lock up. Last thing the company needs is some broken down jury after getting left behind. I have my circle today. Grocery shopping. I see you after. That ain't where a man like that belongs. You had a son, you know. For many folks, the factory is the very heart of this town. What are you doing? I'm going to work. I'll be damned. You just disappear. You're not here. I am. I was. Allery, we can't have you in here. We just can't. Why are you doing this? It's just something I need to do. It's a small town. It's hard to keep secrets around here. You want in that factory? They ain't gonna rest us all, Hillary. You did this, or not me. They're out there because of you. New Liberty's former workers have re-entered the plant and pledged to fulfill the outstanding orders promised to clients. I just want to do my job. You really started something here, this statement of yours. I'm not making any statement, but you are. thing is, a person needs a job to survive, but 
You need work to feel like you're worth something. It's such an amazing trailer because it really captures the essence of the film so beautifully. So Lovell, you actually told me you first read Working Man when you were an intern working with Clark and Stacy. Clark, That's what okay. was it that, that first appealed to you about the film Working Man? Uh, you know, I have to say it because I remember exactly what it was. Someone actually, um, a friend of mine who's a very trusted writer and executive that I know, she told me about a script that was being written um, that she had read uh, by a young writer director um, who you know needed a producer. And I just remember her telling me this sort of log line, which was um, you know really focused on a, a small town factory. At the beginning of the story, the factory closes down, and that you know the town and the workers don't really know what to do, and that there's one older worker who really doesn't know what to do, and that he decides he's just going to keep going to his job every day, even though the factory's closed. And it was really that little you know concept that that triggered me, and I was like, wow, that just seems interesting. I, I have to know what happens. And so, you know, I get pitched a lot of sort of one liners like that, but, and I don't usually say like, please, you know, let me read it. But on that, on that one, I did just because I was so intrigued by the premise. And so um, I read the script and it, and it was equally, you know, compelling and interesting. And um, so I said, look, I need to, you know, I would like to meet with this, uh, this writer. Um, he had never directed anything before, um, but he wanted to, uh, he wanted to direct it. And, uh, you know, he, he had lived in LA for a while, but he had moved back to, to the Midwest in, in Iowa. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it was an interesting kind of situation. I was like, well, you know, you're not really even living here. How this could be kind of challenging. But again, I was so compelled by his story that we, um, you know, I, I took it on and said, let's, uh, let's, let's do this. And did you have any idea just how much it resonates all the more now with COVID? I mean, it's amazing. It must have stunned you both that it was such a resonant message for this day and this time. I mean, I wish I wish I could say we had the foresight ten years ago to you know start developing this project because it would be so relevant. But obviously, at the time, we had no no inkling of any of this, and um, so just like with any project, you just sort of start, you know, putting one foot in front of the other, which is, which is what we did. And, and we, the, the story did evolve quite a bit. We literally developed it for 10 years. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had time to really think it through and to sort of keep working on the story. But no, I, Lovell, I don't think we had any idea of the- Oh, oh, oh of course not. Well, I mean, but I think it's kind of the ultimate irony that even I remember when I read it for the first time, it felt timely even then in terms of the economic realities that so much of the country was first starting to wrestle with. And I think it's almost ironic in that it's so timely, but it's also such a timeless story. Like I think one of the things that Bob has captured so beautifully with this script is that he's written characters that don't feel like they belong in a contemporary movie. You feel like you're watching people from the mid 20th century because they are kind of frozen in this routine, both psychologically and physically. And then over the course of the film, without spoiling too much for those who haven't seen it, the contemporary world does kind of claw its way in and then they're forced to sort of realize that, the, that they have to live in, in the world that they are in. Um, and I think, I think Bob does it so elegantly because there is kind of almost this fable aspect. Because I remember even when I first read the script, and this is something Talia Shire talks about every time about what struck her most and what made her say yes to the project was the audacity of the fact that the lead character really doesn't even speak for the first 45 pages of the script. Um, he just walks everywhere and it's people talking to him and him absorbing things and just kind of being this mirror back toward this community that's around him. Um, but there's something, I, I, I describe it as a classic American story for a contemporary world. And I think it was just by sheer circumstance that there eventually was no more timely story than something about somebody who couldn't bear to stay home alone and just had to get out into the world 
released during a pandemic. Well, that is certainly very eloquently said. So Clark, you mentioned that it took 10 years to bring the film to life. Can you tell us a bit about the journey from reading the screenplay, deciding you wanted to make the film and getting funding and to ultimately be able to shoot it? Absolutely. Um, you know, as a producer, uh, I think the, the model that one has to adopt is sort of a portfolio model in which you're nurturing a lot of different projects because there's so many factors involved with getting a movie greenlit that you really don't know what's gonna happen first and what's gonna happen at all, et cetera. So, you know, because I just responded and the, and the project really resonated with me, I just sort of said, I have no idea how we're gonna do this and how we're gonna get it financed, but I think it's a good story. So let's start working on it. I think it's, it, it is interesting to look back and sort of see the evolution of even just the themes in it, because I think initially it was more about the maybe the economic story of like, oh, what happens to a small town when the factory closes down? Um, and then through our development process, um, there's another theme, which is sort of mental health and mental illness that also, you know, became a bigger part of the story um, as we as we developed it. And, you know, again, I mean, it, independent producing is such a strange profession because there is no easy or like pre-made route from a, from a to B or A to Z. Um, and so, uh, you know, we just sort of, like I said, put one foot in front of the other, kept developing it. At times we would think about like, oh, well, maybe it could be for this actor or that actor. Um, and it really, you know, we did a number of drafts over the years. We talked to a couple of different actors along the way. Um, but it really wasn't until, you know, a couple of years ago that we stumbled upon a financier who seemed really interested in it. And then, you know, once we had that, it's always chicken and egg, you know, with financing. So it's you either got to get a, a star or, you know, a star director or, or you know, it, it also helps to get financing because then you can start, you know, making offers to people. But so we knew we had enough money eventually to make the movie, you know, for a small budget. Um, but we also knew that nobody was going to do it for the money because we didn't have enough money to really offer people to make it worth their while. Um, but one of the interesting things I'll just add uh, when you're making a low budget movie is that it sort of um, automatically screens for passion because um, the only people who are going to get involved in a low budget movie are people who are one way or the other passionate about it because again it's not a it's not done for the most part for financial gain um, and so once we had the financing a few years ago we then said okay now we have the critical mass I think that was when I called Lovell and said hey Lovell remember this project we've got financing um, you know now we can at least start making offers to actors and now we can at least start figuring out where we're going to film this and so that was kind of the you know crescendo of things that came together and, and allowed us to make the movie thanks that's that's a great description of the journey you took and and level just you had a couple of interesting notes about when clark called you and brought you on to the film can you share it with us how it transpired yeah, no, I mean, well, it was it was funny because I remember I, I had just gotten back to LA from spending Christmas with my family. It was it was January of 2018. And I was literally in the cab back from the airport, and I was thought, "Wow, I really don't know what I'm going to be doing for the next couple of months. Like things are actually kind of open." And like literally within two minutes, Clark called me, and he was like, "Um, I need to talk to you. Something's happening. Do you remember Working Man?" Um, and he's like, can you be in Chicago in April? Um, and I was like, yes, yes, I can. Um, but no, it's, uh, when I revisited the script from when I had read it the first time, I, I was definitely was looking at it through a slightly different lens in that my father had gotten a little bit older at that time too. And like, he, he ironically enough, our lead actor, Peter Garrity is approximately one day older than my father. They are hmm. one day apart. Um, they are both 80 year old gentlemen. Um, and rereading the script, I saw so much of my dad because he had a hazardous waste disposal company. So even once we were on set and we're working in this fully operational plastics factory just outside of Chicago, 
just the smells and the textures of everything was such a visceral like callback to my childhood in so many ways. And so consequently, at least for me, I kind of always like to say like, who in my life am I making a specific project for? Because I think it's always good to have an answer, whether it's yourself or it's a friend or anyone. Like for this one, it very much felt like the kind of greater purpose for me outside of just practicality was being there to, to make a movie for my dad. And so it was also the first time my parents ever got to visit me on set. Um, and so having them there for that with this particular story and also with Clark there who had given me my first job in the industry, um, it very much felt like a full circle moment that I was really grateful for. And so very, you very- also, You also got to- you also got to cast your parents um, as extras. Yes, yes, my parents have a special cameo um, in uh, in one of the scenes late in the film. Uh, a plus extras, the role my mother was born to play. What a great story. And you two are very clearly a case of like where the stars align with both of you together. So what I'd love to do now is to start sharing some of the great clips from the film. So sure. the first one up is the return to the factory level. Can you set the stage for this for everyone? Yeah. No, of course. I think, uh, I think this moment kind of really encapsulates so much of what the movie turns on that we see our, our lead character played by Peter Garrity decide to return to the factory. And you see all the characters in the world kind of taking it, him in as he makes this choice which they at the time think is kind of uh, a bit eccentric. Um, but more than anything, I think the film, uh, we have such a beautiful score by David Gonzalez. And I think this particular sequence spotlights that um, at its absolute best. So that's another reason why this is one of my, my favorites. Hillary, what are you doing? I'm going to work. So one of the things that really struck me about Working Man is that the film really shows us how much of our personal lives and our sense of self, as well as our livelihood is connected to work. And one of the characters in the film says, when they lose their jobs, they robbed us of what we had and who we are. So, and, and, and then as we were saying, the film came out when America was reeling from unexpected unemployment. And so Allery, as I think you mentioned, Lovell, really gave a voice to so many people and a lot of people could identify with him. So in, in that sense, the film is much more uh, than a story about a decommissioned factory. And Lovell, you mentioned when we were starting to talk about the film that the film is really about learning how to move on in the world when everything's been taken from you. And I'd love it if you would both speak a little bit about this and what it means to you. Sure, Clark. <laughs> uh, I mean, like I said, it, it was really that concept. Um, somehow it was this concept of like a person dealing with loss in kind of an irrational way um, I, that I think struck a chord in me. And, you know, I, when I look back, I, I sort of, you know, I like movies where 
individuals do kind of inexplicable things for reasons that they themselves perhaps don't even know. And so, you know, it, it was that, that idea that, you know, in order to deal with the loss of his job, um, you know, this is what, you know, this is what he does. Um, but, you know, once, once I read the script, then you also start to realize again, without, you know, giving too much away, that there's other loss in his life. And that, you know, part of the reason, you know, part of the meaning of his work is dealing with other loss. And so it's sort of loss upon loss. And, um, you know, again, these themes, they, they just sort of coalesced in, in this unique story. I mean, I, I love it. I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, no, it's funny. I, I, I've actually been thinking about loss a lot recently. Um, I, I, I read um, this beautiful poem by Elizabeth Bishop, which I'm sure m many folks will know called, called the uh, One Art. Uh, but the basic gist of it is the art of losing isn't hard to master. Um, and I think, I think within the context of the film, the losses do start to add up uh, for all the characters. But I think by the end, they also come to the conclusion that maybe you are losing something in order to gain something else. Um, and I think, I think it speaks a great deal to the power of survival because I, I've, I've said, um, to, to some other people before that I think the film is about characters who have really been pulled underneath the water. Um, they've been pulled underneath a, with a very strong undertow. And I think watching them fight to get back to the surface, um, we love watching characters who want to survive, who want to figure out how to survive. And I think, I think the fact that Bob tuned in on that particular frequency so elegantly um, is what really elevates the film to being more than just a, a story about a decommissioned factory. And it's also interesting because that, that power of survival is very different for different people. And uh, Allery's wife, Iola, played by Talia Shire, asks him, what are you doing? And he replies very matter-of-factly, I'm going to work but she doesn't really understand why it's so important for him to go to work. So she asked their pastor to come speak to Allery. So that's the next scene, which is called Pastor Mark. And Lovell, can you, can you set it up for us with more detail? Of course, no, Pastor Mark, um, it, it's very much established that Pastor Mark is Iola's go-to uh, within, within the world of the film. And I, I think this moment just, on a basic level, it does show like how frustrating it can be that you can't penetrate the walls of someone you care about so much that you have to seek outside counsel, which I think is a very universal experience that we all at some point in our lives do encounter one way or another. But I also just love this scene because I think it, it also shows the power of Peter and Talia just as actors in terms of finding these light moments of comedy, even when the situations the characters are wrestling with are incredibly emotionally dev devastating. So, Ellery, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Good. Good. Very pleased to hear that. You know, we're living in very uncertain times. The factory closing. I know for many folks, plastics were the very heart of this town. So I don't think you're alone in facing this. Excuse me. Sorry, come again? I said, would you excuse me for a moment? Yes, of course.
this scene has captured, I'm sure, times for many of us when we wanted to have this really wonderful conversation and the other person just completely signs out. So yeah, how all, does you, this... all you get is a coat hanger clattering to the floor. <laughs> yeah. How does this scene capture these two deep characters for each of you? I mean, again, so much of both of their performances are in what they don't say. <laughs> um, and, you know, even though I've seen this scene a number of times, I can't help but sort of laugh because, you know, Peter, you know, Peter Garrity, he's 80 years old and this is his first starring role, but he's been an actor for, you know, more than 50 years. And he's, um, he's the master of, <laughs> of sort of full body acting and and he can you know he can carry a film without saying a word for for 40 pages so um you know just watching him react to this young whippersnapper pastor and then just seeing talia who you know she's just so sort of awkward with the whole thing but you know even if you think back to talia in like her role in Rocky, I mean, she was so good with that kind of awkward <laughs> awkwardness, you know? And again, I think in that moment, she just, you know, she embodies that's the awkwardness of, of what's happening. So I, I don't know, I, I hope other people enjoy it as much as I do. No, and I think Talia, <laughs> excuse me, Talia especially is one of the smartest people I've ever met, but both intellectually and emotionally. And she's just got such a, a great read on like the emotional dynamics within any given situation. And so I think she very wisely kind of, and, and Peter as well, they both push against the things like in a scene like that where like someone could be like, oh my, he won't talk. I won't talk. No, no, but you must talk. They're just like, it's kind of like the, the standoff of like, you going? No. You? No. And just like, well, so we'll just have a polite off. Um, <laughs> and so I think, and I think that that type of observation is, I think they understand the emotional lives really well of people who don't like that they have emotional lives, um, which I think is a very hard thing to nail and to do so respectfully and with dignity. And that's one of the things that I commend both of them for so much. How did you find Peter and Talia for this role? How did the casting process evolve? Oh, Clark has has all the Talia stories. I, I will defer to Clark. And Peter, Talia. you gave him his first starring role. How did that evolve? I mean, I mean, just the evolution of it was, look, we just knew we needed great actors. And it was like, it's a challenge because it's like, we need great actors and we don't have a lot of money. So we really had to like rack our brains and go through lists and figure out like, who is it that we could get? Because also when you're casting older actors, sometimes all their agents are suggesting these sort of old TV stars that, you know, it's just like not what you want for your, for your film. But um, Italia and I are actually friends. We've done several movies together over the years. We've known each other for yeah a couple decades. Um, and so, you know, she, we were sort of trying to cast all three of the lead roles at the, at the same time. Um, but she, uh, you know, I, Bob, Bob and Lovell and I were talking and she just, one day, I don't know, we were looking at lists and everything and she wasn't even on the list. And I was just like, what about Talia? <laughs> Your time Oscar nominee, Talia Shire. Why not Talia? <laughs> She's my friend. Um, and so anyways, Bob, you know, Bob gravitated to the idea. I called Talia, I sent it to her. I mean, as Lovell said, she's so smart and she's such an outside the box thinker. Like, you know, she like she read the script and she, I just remember her saying, it just has such a rhythm, you know, such a rhythm. Like she she reacts to things that no one else, you know, even feels. Um, and so anyway, so she she came on board and then, um, you know, Peter was just on a list and, and we studied his work and we were like, this guy's great. And so we again, we were just very very lucky to to get him and then um billy brown who's also a real i think you know kind of revelation in our film yeah. you know he he's a he's a star of from how to get away with murder and um you know was just Thank looking yeah. looking for something interesting to do and again we were just so lucky to send the project to him and he and he responded that's great you actually offered a lot of firsts with this film clark between Peter getting a lead role and Bob getting to write and direct. 
a big film you know when when you're um when you're doing when you're doing something um for not a lot of money you have to offer offer opportunity um as much as you're offering uh money i i love your your term that you really screen for passion when it's a lower budget film and that passion comes across in what you ended up producing so we discussed that uh iola wasn't very happy that um allery was going to work even less happy was the company in terms of having him basically trespass on the premises in order to be able to do his job with no pay. So the next scene we're going to share with you all is when Allery is brought home and it's not by his free will. Can you set this one up for us, Level? Yes. So this is uh, a moment in which Allery has been breaking into the factory for several days now and um, the company's gotten wind of it. So the police come to give him a little ride home. And for him, it's kind of the the death knell of what he thinks he's been fighting for but what he doesn't realize is that billy brown's character walter is seeing what's going on in a new way and that's sparking an idea for him ellery how you doing Everything okay there? I'm okay. Allery, we can't have you in here. We just can't. Hey, check, check the scanner, check the... shouldn't bring a man like that home. That ain't where he belongs. Mr. Parks. I don't want to have to do this again. Surprise. An Such even better surprise is that we have Stacy. <laughs> oh, yay. Hi, Stacy. We're thrilled to have you here. Oh, thank and you. I'm, I'm renaming myself so I'm not another Clark Peterson. <laughs> very good. Well, we, and you came straight from editing Sex Life, right? That is right. Straight from one uh, Zoom to another. Because <laughs> so everything's we're, remote. We're, we're really thrilled to have you here. And, and it's you bring up an interesting point, which is that while we're dealing with so many unfortunate challenges to COVID, one of the silver linings aside from the one that you all are going to share with us pertaining to film is that we're able to have great uh, speakers <laughs> like you coming in from the West Coast to be able to share your vision for the work you do and also the impact of film. So it's wonderful to have you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so and, much. And we just saw this incredible scene when Allery was brought home from the factory. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about it is the magic of film is on display here because it's incredible to me that this really depicts a small Midwestern town, but you found that Midwestern town and the factory you were looking for in Chicago. <laughs> so I'd love to understand about how that ended up happening. And also, I understand that you have these neighbors on the street, but they're actually not on the same street, nor in the same neighborhood, nor did you film it on the same day. So again, the magic of Hollywood. Can you fill us in about that? You're sure, giving away all our secrets, yeah. Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the perfect street. It was just 
different sides of different streets made the perfect street. Um, and so, no, it's, I think, I think I, I, I appreciate this scene because it's, it's always one of those moments on set where you're like, is this going to work? Like, or when we, when we get in that editing room, is this actually going to, is this going to add up? Um, and, and it's such, just such a testament to not only Bob, but our, our DP, Piero Basso, and our editor, Morgan Halsey, um, who are really able to make it feel seamless, even just like having the car, the cop cars tracking through one side so that then when you cut to the other side, you have the expectation of movement to do the stitching for you. Um, but, the, but they were definitely calibrating like, oh, is this roughly the height of Billy looking like this here, there? So it, uh, it definitely uh, took a little bit of calculus, but uh, they got it done. And yeah. how did you pick Chicago? I mean, just to quickly speak to that, I mean, really the, the location is important. And as a lot of people have said, like the factory kind of becomes another character in the film. And, you know, we, we got our financing and then the next thing was, okay, where can we go to get the most for our money? And we really were hoping to go to the Midwest. Um, you know, we thought about Canada, California, and then like none of those places had the, the feel or had the sort of DNA. I mean, Bob, Bob, the director, writer, being from the Midwest, he really, you know, knew the essence of this kind of a town. And so we really wanted to capture that. Um, but Chicago had a lot to offer. They had a tax credit in Illinois. You know, what, when Bob went there to sort of scout, what he found out is like, you can be in a suburb of Chicago and it still feels like a working town because it's basically a working suburb. And we found just pretty much everything we needed there to shoot, but also you have the infrastructure of a major city. You have, you know, you can fly people in, you've got nice hotels for your actors. It just seemed to all add up. And so we said, okay, great, let's do it in Chicago. That's great. And I wanna say, Stacey, we have one more clip from Working Man, That's and great. then we're gonna get into a broader discussion about the pandemic and we wanna hear about sex life so oh sure but, sure sure so so the next scene that we're going to share is a lighter more comedic scene uh that level has picked and can you set up this scene for us and share why it's important yes no well i mean i, I won't spoil too much because i think this does have the line that pretty much everyone who i've spoken to agrees is their favorite line in the film but it's another moment of peter and talia in their beautiful marriage of 40 years that was crafted over the course of 10 days. Um, and so, yeah, they, they are going over to Walter's house for dinner. Hey, your wife come over tonight. Have supper with me this evening. My, my wife usually. You tell, uh, what's your wife's name? Iola. Iola, supper ready in an hour. Don't have to bring a thing. I don't like this. We don't know this man very well. You don't know him at all. I know he has a beard. And my mother told me, be wary of men with beards. Why? Because they have something to hide. What about Jesus? Iola, pleasure to meet you. Huh? Come in. That is such an amazing line, so beautifully written. So now let's let's talk about the pandemic and the impact it had. Oh, but wait, I wanted to ask you something. You you brought up kind of as a as a, a minor thought. Ten days is that all that Talia and Peter had known each other for? Yeah, when Talia they... was only Talia was only on set ten days. Uh, we we shot the whole movie in twenty, uh, nineteen days in Chicago, and then wow. one day in Joliet, in the I'm... the coldest April that Chicago had seen since the eighteen eighties. So did that cause a problem? Did you get snow days that it had to we slow did. down the? We did have a couple of days that required some reshuffling, but um, miraculously we we made it happen. And and it's amazing because they really do appear to be a couple who've been married for 40 years. So it's just astonishing that they were able to form this bond within 10 days. All right, so back to the pandemic and the topic of the evening, which is the impact it had on filming. So first we're gonna talk about Working Man, then 
I really want to hear about sex life. I know, Stacy's were... got all the good stuff here. <laughs> okay, I know yeah, we're going to talk about the release of the film with you, but then with Stacy, we're going to find out about actually shooting the film and all the challenges. So you were supposed to release the film in theaters in March 2020. We all know what happened in March 2020. So what happened for you with regards to the film? Well, we were super excited that our little film uh, got a theatrical release. Um, and that meant that it was gonna be released in a few theaters in a few cities. But you know what, when you have a small film, that's awesome and amazing and you know, rarely happens. So we were super excited. It was gonna come out the end of March. And then by like, I think March 10th or something, it became clear that this was not gonna happen. And we all went into sort of momentary depression, like, oh man, we had our big chance and now we've lost it. But what we didn't realize was sort of the flip side of what was about to happen to us. And Lovell, you wanna take it from there? Sure. Yeah, well, one of the interesting kind of, I think, democratizations of what's happened over the last year is that originally, traditionally, uh, film critics can only really review films that are playing in theaters in the city with which their paper is affiliated. So for example, if, if you want even to be eligible for the New York Times to review your film, you have to be playing at a theater in New York. And even then there's no guarantee that the Times will be able to come. And there are very ex expensive theaters to rent and things like that. And so oftentimes it's a conversation with a distributor about what is going to be the best use of funds for a theatrical release. And, it, and it, it's a big game of chess. Um, but when the pandemic came down and suddenly all the theaters were closed, suddenly every single film was theoretically eligible with every single critic. And so suddenly we found ourselves getting reviews and exposure that we were never quote unquote supposed to get because of that barrier to entry. And so we got the New York Times Review, we got the Washington Post, we got Deadline and all these other really meaningful publications. And they really understood the film and they really understood what Bob was trying to achieve with it. Um, and watching that happen was so gratifying and just, and again, if it had not been for the pandemic, I don't think that is the scenario that we would have found ourselves in. But it also just, because of the subject of the film, um, it just really took on a, a whole other life. Um, you know, not only were we eligible for all these critics to, to write about us, but they all wanted to write about us because suddenly everyone's lost, you know, a lot of people have lost their jobs uh, in America. And suddenly there's a film about people losing their jobs. And so it was just a very, you know, strange serendipity that, that took place. But that is, I believe, the reason that we got so much interest and so much coverage and, you know, national coverage in major publications. Um, and again, it's just like this very strange silver lining to this very unique year that we've had. It is, and you've had such tremendous acclaim through all the reviews that it's, it's a wonderful silver lining for you. So, so Stacy, we did a, a brief intro of you before you were here, and we're thrilled to have you about your being showrunner of the Emmy-nominated drama Unreal, and that you're currently in post-production uh, as showrunner of the new Netflix series Sex Life. Fill us in. I know you were filming up in Toronto and encountering a lot of challenges. We, I had heard from Nicole Yorkin, who's who's currently filming another Netflix series, that there, Netflix has like a 42-page document of COVID protocols. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, let me just say first of all that I'm such I'm very, so happy to be here, but so happy to be here, you know, not only in support of my husband and and this great film, but you know, Lovell, if, if when you did your introductions, did you explain how Lovell came into our lives? I mean, I don't know if that you have people on the Zoom who are just film lovers who are interested in hearing about the film, but if they're aspiring filmmakers, um, you know, Lovell's is the best success story that I know to tell of someone who, you know, started out as our intern and is now producing movies with Clark and writing movies with me. And so I just feel, you know, he's done it right. So his story is one 
to follow. I just want to sort of say that. Um, no, and I, 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 will, I will say <laughs> until I'm blue in the face that I could not have had more better and attentive mentors than Stacy and Clark. Oh. I, I, I hit the lottery. Well, that is a whole, you know, a whole other conversation about like what level did that that was so right, you know, to that he got sort of the trajectory that he had. But I will answer your question about COVID. So, you know, we are incredibly privileged to work for a company like Netflix, who frankly has the resources to spend um, uh, on what it takes to make it safe to film during a pandemic. And, um, and I was also incredibly fortunate to have a line producer who was he's, I mean, you know, he's what you would want in a line producer, which is just, he is a can-do kind of guy, you know, who figures things out, but he was sort of determined that we, you know, with the resources that Netflix was providing, that we could figure this out, and, um, and it was certainly not easy. I mean, yes, there are, you know, all of the safety protocols that have to do with um, PPE and testing and air filtration and distancing and zones and uh, sanitation and and all of all of those things. Um, it's also we shot differently. We shot really by location rather than by episode. So we were, you know, we had four different directors shooting eight episodes. And there were a couple of days where we had all four directors directing um, in a certain location. And, um, you know, certainly fewer extras. There's an algorithm um, that you can take the square footage of the space that you have. And that will determine how many people you can have in the space and how many extras. Um, but we, you know, we are a show that has a great deal of um, intimacy. And uh, people were saying, that's, well, you're just, you're not going to be able to shoot that, you know, and, and we did. And I mean, we're fortunate that most of the intimacy really is between the four main characters. Um, so it was limited, you know, in that way. But I, I do think it is, you know, we are proud to be an example that, that this is possible, you know, it just takes smart people. And yes, it takes real resources, you know, but it's a, uh, you know, Clark and I, our kids go to public school in LA. They are still on Zoom. They have been on Zoom for almost a full year. And it's been a real heartbreak that I, you know, we don't have anywhere near the resources. Their school doesn't have, or LAUSD doesn't have anywhere near the resources, you know, of a Netflix um, to be able to make it possible to go back to school. So it's, you know, I can go back to work and I can help all of the people who work on our show go back to work, but I can't get my kids back in school. So that's, you know, a big part of the reality I think that we're facing these days. And, you know, and sometimes it feels frankly embarrassing. Um, but uh, I also know that good television and film is a lot of what has gotten people through this pandemic, you know, and, and so, you know, you got to keep uh, entertaining the masses so we don't all <laughs> slip into those depressions and, you know, and, and try to uh, try to just imagine our way out of this, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very true being able to stream shows and watch films has very much kept people, you know, feeling connected and having something that enriches their lives during a very challenging time. Fill us in a little bit about sex life and what it's about. And then when you're ready, I'd love to have you come back to do a talk specifically yeah. about that too. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, so sex life uh, is about a woman who is a wife and mom. She's just had her second baby. She is still up all night, breastfeeding, not sleeping through the night and with a toddler too, and sort of wondering who am I now? <laughs> because she used to be a real wild child in her uh, single in the city days. And so she starts to write in her journal about those wild child single in the city days and um, in particular about her impossibly sexy ex-boyfriend Brad and so the show exists in the two time periods when she was that single girl with impossibly sexy Brad and the present where she has a beautiful life and a beautiful husband and a beautiful family um, and no sex and um, and uh, and so then 
I will say her husband reads her journal and he had no idea that she was such a wild child nor that she was uh, so unhappy. And so trouble ensues. <laughs> So, but it's really, it's, it's at its core, it's really um, very much about female identity and desire and, and who we are once we become wives and mothers and what happens to the, that other part of ourselves that um, women are often told we're supposed to give up when we become wives and mothers and, and yet it, it never really fully goes away. And is that really fair to say that, that, that we should, that we should have to give that up, you know, so, you know, Don Draper gets to come home at the end of the pilot of Mad Men and reveal that uh, that suburban life is, you know, family life is, is not enough for him. But we have uh, eight episodes to explore whether or not it's going to be enough for Billy, our main character. So we'll see. What a great storyline. That's definitely going to be at the top of my streaming list. So it okay, sounds great. 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 One thing that I want to make sure we talk about tonight, because I think it's really going to fascinate our audience, is that Clark, when, when we were chatting the other evening, I was so surprised when you told us the story of your journey with the Oscar winning film Monster with Charlize Theron. And it's an amazing view of the challenges of filmmaking. So I'd love it if you would share it with our audience. Sure. Um, just, yeah, briefly, as I said before, like when you embark on a small independent film, you really have no idea of where it's going, how you're going to get there or anything. You just have to put one foot in front of the other and hope for the best. And so, you know, we, um, we, we're lucky enough, Patty Jenkins was just graduating from the AFI and she decided to write this story and uh, a friend of mine um, read it and then brought me in and we said, you know, this is a, a great piece. We think we can possibly get this financed. Um, you know, Patty had done hardly, you know, nothing really, a couple of student films. And so um, we were so fortunate, again, this is like long story short, but we we went to a financier who said, look, if you can get one of these five actresses to do this, then I'll, you know, I'll put up some money. And so we, um, we were like, okay, great. And who knows if he even thought we would get any of them, but we, you know, it was such a great role for a woman. And, you know, then as, you know, I think less now, but still, still there's room for improvement. You know, there were just not that many great roles for women. And so, Fortunately, we sent it to these five actresses. They all were interested in doing it. Uh, but, you know, Charlize, I think was, you know, she wasn't a big name, but she at least, you know, had some name to her. And so we uh, we went off and we got a few million dollars and we went to Florida in that case, because that was where this story took place. We actually shot it in and around the places that Eileen Wernos, the character who the film is based on, actually lived. And we, you know, again, it was another thing where we barely had enough money to do anything, but everybody pitched in. Charlize was a producer on the film as well. And we scraped it together and, and she like, you know, was doing these amazing things on set and our makeup person was doing such a great job of transforming her and Charlize herself like put on 30 pounds to do the role. And, you know, all of that was like, wow, this is so cool. But again, it was just like a tiny little movie that we were making in Florida. Nobody thought anything, believe me, of awards or anything like that. We just thought, okay, well, this is a great little movie. And so we made the movie, we cut the movie together, you know, and we looked at it and we're like, yeah, this is pretty good, you know, and look at what Charlize is doing. This is pretty good. And so we were proud of it um, and we took it out, uh, you know, back then we took it out on VHS cassette and we showed it to all of the distributors in Hollywood, including you know, Paramount Classics and, and Warner Brothers uh, Independent and, you know, all of, you know, Fox Searchlight and the Weinstein Company, all of the people, all of the distributors that the movie would have been perfect for. They all looked at the film and they all said, you know, thank you, but no thank you. They all had their various reasons to pass, but they all passed on the film. And I was, as I was saying to you, Wendy, I mean, this is like, it's such a strange thing, but it also shows that like, nobody knows anything in our business, which is a kind of famous adage, um, because 
it's not like they read a script and they decided to pass on it. They actually saw the movie and they saw the performance <laughs> and they still all passed on the movie. Um, and by the way, that performance, you know, a few months later was going to win uh, Best Actress, but all of these highly paid executives somehow couldn't see that. So we had to go back to our investor and say, you know, sorry, we tried to get distribution for the film, but nobody wants it. Um, is there any way you could put up a couple million dollars just so we can pay a distribution company to distribute the film? And so, um, because that's the other way to get a film out there. Um, we did have one interested buyer, but that was Blockbuster, the video company. So we were able to like sell the video rights to Blockbuster. They took video and television, and then we went and paid another company to take the film out into theaters. And lo and behold, we started putting it out there and the film really started working, which in a weird way was kind of like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do now? Because if you put a film out and it starts working, the thing you have to do is keep expanding. I mean, we released it in two theaters, um, but you have to keep expanding it to get it out there. And we were getting all this buzz and Golden Globe nominations and all this stuff. Anyway, again, long story short, you know, we ended up, well, we couldn't get any more money from our distributor after it started working. So we had to go to Blockbuster and say, hey, Blockbuster, could you guys please put up money because you hold all the, all the upside. They ended up you know, putting in every week, they were putting in more and more money. The, the film went from two theaters to about 1200 theaters. Um, and, you know, long story short, we, we won the Oscar, we won the Golden Globe. We, you know, Charlize was nominated for 13 awards and she won them all. Um, and I was, as I was saying to you, you know, the night of the Oscars, it was pretty crazy because there were a, a lot of distributors coming up to me saying like, oh, wow, we really missed the boat on that one. Um, but I think the lesson in all of that is simply, you know, you, you have to listen to your, yourself and to your own vision and your own passion. And just because a lot of people tell you it's not good, they don't like it, it's not commercial, whatever they're going to tell you, if you truly believe in it, you got to keep going. Because again, it just shows you nobody knows anything in our business and you have to have your own kind of true north if you're going to make it through that. Well, and I think it also there's also the great connection when Peter arrived in Chicago, Clark, and we were standing in the lobby of the hotel and he just looks at you, he goes, I was supposed to be in your movie. And you just looked at him so like, like, excuse me. And do, do you want to tell the rest of it? Just because I think it's such a small world. Great story. I mean, you can keep going. I just remember, yes, he was going to have a, a role in Monster. What were the details? Yeah, he was going to have a role in Monster because he and Charlize had done Legend of Bagger right. Games together. And right. she was like hell bent on him playing this one part. But he was doing a Susan Laurie Parks play in New York. And so he was unable to come down to Florida. Right. Um, and he was like, we're finally together when we were supposed to be together 15 years ago. <laughs> It all paid off in working, man. There you go. That, that really is an amazing story about the importance of just sticking to it when you believe in something. So we have an, a very interesting question for you. One thing that strikes me about Working Man is how real, how not dressed up it feels. As a new screenwriter, I'm trying to find a balance of depicting real life and also dressing things up enough to still provide an escape for a viewer. What are the challenges of depicting this kind of realism on screen? Hmm, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I have to say, I mean, Bob, um, and I wish were, he were here to speak to this, but, you know, Bob, again, grew up in and around this kind of a community and he really knew the characters, he knew the places and so, uh, a lot of it started on the page just because he was writing about something that he knows. And I know that's a cliche, but, you know, I think it's true. If you really know something, you can make it feel real on the page. Um, and there were a lot of details that he was able to bring to these people and, and to the scenes um, that were very authentic. Secondly, I think he also knew that he had to find the right location. And when he walked into that factory, he just knew like, okay, this is it. And so much of it, like, again, if we were to, you know, have tried to make the film in LA or, 
you know, Toronto or wherever it might be, it probably would not have had that authentic feel. And the fact that we were able to shoot in the Midwest, I think also really helped us a lot with that. No, so I would agree. yeah, I would agree. And I would say too, um, in terms of trusting the locations, I think, <clears throat> I think it's okay to pick things that are non-negotiables. I, I was just talking to a director about this because she was asking me, because we were in the middle of the casting process right now. And she was like, okay, well, what am I allowed to say no on? And I said, pick what you care about the most. You can't say no to everything. Like you've got to have some places where you're willing to compromise, but you have every right to pick at least two things where you say, and in her case, we kind of came to the conclusion it was casting and location. And I say, you can, those two things can be the hill you want to die upon. Um, because I think everyone needs to have the thing in any creative process that you know you won't budge on because it then allows you more bargaining space elsewhere um, and flexibility elsewhere in terms of being a collaborator. That's a great point. A number of people are interested in hearing about what's next for the three of you. And one thing that I think has impacted it based on our discussions is that filmmaking is a challenge right now because budgets are exploding due to COVID protocols. And it's also hard to get insurance to produce a film. So fill us in about what's next for you and how those decisions have been impacted by COVID. Clark, you wanna start? Sure. Um, so one of the things that's happened is that, and it, I've been able to sort of, you know, it, directly and indirectly experienced both of these. Um, being with Stacy, you know, we moved our whole family to Toronto so that we could film there, she could film there, um, and I could be the support system. And, but the, the point is like with Netflix's resources, they were able to film and they completed, you know, 81 days of, of principal photography. Um, I'm, I pride myself on being a, an independent film producer, but also I, I do television. Um, but on the independent film side, I'm very uh, involved at the Producers Guild. So involved with talking to a lot of producers all the time. And unfortunately at the moment, independent film producing is extremely difficult, if not nearly impossible. Um, there's a kind of a simple reason, which is, well, there's a few reasons, but A, we don't have the resources to, to throw at the problem of COVID. Um, B, uh, whenever you get an independent movie financed, you need insurance to insure the production. And, you know, in case people get sick or whatever, the insurance has to step in. Um, but insurance companies will not insure right now for COVID related losses. And so no financier will put up any money uh, for an independent film unless they want to take that risk themselves. And very few people want to take that risk themselves. So, you know, at the moment, the independent film community is kind of on hold. Um, TV is able to keep going because it's backed by these big companies that self-insure and they take the risks themselves. And so just for me personally, I'm focusing on a lot of my TV projects, trying to move those forward because those are the things that are moving forward at the moment more so than the independent films. Thank you for those insights. How about you, Stacey? I know you're deeply involved now uh, in post-production, but do you have other things in the pipeline that you're working on simultaneously? Um, yeah, I always have, um, you know, you gotta have a bunch of irons in the fire. So, uh, you know, I'm squarely focused on television and squarely focused on complicated, deeply flawed, female protagonists so uh uh i have a couple of other things in development um in that way and then you know hopefully looking to a season two of um of sex life you know and uh we were i was we were just talking today about if we film in the fall are we filming with covid or not with covid you know and um are we filming the same way we filmed or or not you know so uh it's a it's a it's a really interesting time to which of course I said I think we're filming with COVID um, by the way <laughs> but um, uh, but we'll see I mean look it is a real sort of inflection point for for film you know Netflix is certainly doing a lot more feature film um, and you know I'm 
talking to them about about some of that too and it's exciting i mean they were talking about releasing a new film every week you know next year and so that's a lot of film to do and so it's true i do think that this the the independent film world is changing the sort of idea of like you can go out and and get the money together is is challenging right now because it is hard to get um that insurance but on the other hand i think that you know there are streaming services that are going to step into that sort of smaller budget movie in a way that they hadn't been before so that's you know that's the silver lining perhaps at this time thank you and level how about you yeah, no, I mean, it's funny because I definitely, I, 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 what, to what Clark was saying about none of us know anything, there definitely have been some moments in the last couple of months where everything that I would have said a year ago about how to get a movie made completely out the window. Um, uh, I, I signed on a couple of weeks ago to a project by another Princeton alum, uh, a gentleman named Henry Lovner and uh, his directing partner, Stephen Cantor, um, that they shot, I, I, I jumped in during as a producer during the post process because they shot the whole film in quarantine for a minuscule amount of money. And the crew was literally Henry, Steven, and Henry's girlfriend, Claudia Restrepo, who was the producer. And they did absolutely everything. And when he showed me the film, if you told me that they had spent $500,000 on it, I would have believed you. And so I think it does... It, it completely, I'm like, I now say like, this is the exception to every rule that I thought I knew about filmmaking because it's it's a damn good film. It's it's a smart firecracker of a comedy about these this couple who break up the night before lockdown goes into effect. So then they're stuck together for all of quarantine living in the same house. And it's called The End of Us. Um, and uh, we, we, we will hopefully uh, be bringing it out before the end of the year, but it's... Um, but yeah, it's that to me has kind of given me so much hope about like, wow, if these if these guys were able to shoot a film that is this good while all this stuff is going on, then really anything is possible. And there are ways that we can burrow our way through this kind of mountain of calamity that we seem to find ourselves on with new things each day. But But until then, <laughs> Lots of development stuff, lots of getting ducks in a row, lots of planning for when when the Iron Curtain lifts for all of us. So that that's a great tie into our next question, which really I think harkens back to Clark mentioning that he takes a portfolio approach to filmmaking. So uh, we have a question. Can you please talk about your portfolio, how projects ripen in the portfolio and how projects don't ripen? <laughs> if only we, if only we knew the answer to that question, we would all be even much more successful. Yeah, how do projects um, die on the vine? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, any of us can take a stab. I think we, it's hard to know, you know, is the real answer. And some things come together really quickly. Like, you know, when I when I was doing Monster, that came together really quickly, and that you know ultimately was probably my most successful film. Um, but there's sort of no rhyme or reason. Uh, I think that the development process, you know, working with a writer and developing a script is unpredictable. You know, you just don't know if it's going to take one month or 10 years <laughs> um, to get to get the script where it needs to be. Um, and in the case of Working Man, it, it's not that it took 10 years to get the script where it needed to be, but it was sort of like while we were trying to figure out how to get it financed, we just um we kept working on it so you know it's the, that's sort of how you do it you just can keep keep developing and try to keep working the material i mean lovell and stacy you can probably speak to this as well well i also think that it's helpful clark for people to hear how you choose the projects that you decide to add to your portfolio and the advice you give in terms of you know what projects spark your interest when you get approached by them um, I mean, I think that there's, you know, many different people may have different criteria or different reasons or different things that attract them to projects. But I think the one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, when you, um, you know, when you get involved with a project, um, if I can use this analogy, it's sort of like getting married 
or at least like, you know, dating seriously because you're going to be being a surrogate for someone's child <laughs> or, or, or that um, because you're going to be together. You know, you're going to be with this project for a while. I mean, you know, if you get involved in a movie minimum, it's a minimum a year and it might be 10. Um, and so you better be comfortable with that and you better like it and it better resonate with you and you better be, you know, feeling good about it when you wake up in the morning and knowing that that's what you're putting out into the world. So, you know, it is kind of a personal thing. And, and again, I have no reason, I, you know, I just like with working man, it's just, again, it was just like chemistry. It was like, wow, this is an incredible story. I want to work with this filmmaker. Um, but yeah, that's sort of my, you know, my technique. I would say too, I think a good thing to throw out and I, and I think this can apply to, to any industry in terms of taking on a project or an endeavor is I kind of always ask, like, there, there are kind of three things. Am I excited by the material? Am I excited by the people working on it? Is it going to pay me well? <laughs> and I think at this point, at least for me, if it, it needs to satisfy two of the three. Um, so it's like great material, great money, the people, eh, we'll see. I, I might still say yes. Um, great people, great money. The script will improve it. It'll be great. Um, but so I think that that's kind of, I think it is important to have rubrics. And I think also for me, I've learned not to say yes to something until I've had at least two meetings about it. Um, just because you, you want to test and see like, at least like if nothing else is this person going to listen to me like they don't need to take what I say as gospel they don't need to do everything that I tell them as a producer but I need to at least know that if I say something to them it will be heard and it will be evaluated and it might be discarded but it will at least be heard because if they're not going to listen to you right at the start then they're definitely not going to listen to you three days into production <laughs> That is really tremendous advice. Thank you for that. And our last question actually focuses very much on Working Man. So uh, we have a question. Can you explain the scene where Walter loses his temper at a coworker during the card game? He slams his fist and exclaims something which to us was unintelligible. What was the issue? He was trying to get them to turn the police scanner down. There you go. <laughs> um, no, he. Uh, it's the start of, uh, for those who've seen the movie, um, obviously there's a lot going on under the surface of Walter. Um, he has high highs, he has low lows, and that scene is kind of a turning point where we start getting a sense that the roller coaster might be cresting down the other side of the hill. Okay, well, on that note, I really want to thank you all. This has been so enlightening and fascinating. So thank you, Clark Lovell and Stacy, for joining us to share thank your you. amazing thank experiences you. in film and television and inside view into Working Man and Sex Life. It's really been incredible. And this is such a challenging time for all of us. It's nice to know there's been a silver lining to the pandemic for your amazing film, Working Man. I also want to thank the Princeton Club of New York, Princeton Association of New York City, Princeton Arts Alumni, Princeton Club of Southern California, and Princeton in Hollywood for co-sponsoring this program with us. And thank you to my fellow co-hosts, Rob Walk and Pilar castro Kilts. And a big thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. So again, as I said, we're recording the talk. We will be sending everyone the link and also the private link to Working Man so you can see the film if you haven't already. We'll be available live for the rest of this month and we'll be sending that link in a follow-up email. So please join us. We have other terrific upcoming programs including a talk by Melody Hobson on financial literacy on February 11th a screening of the film Burden and a discussion of diversity, equity and inclusion I'll be hosting on February 25th. So we hope you'll join us for those. Despite the challenges of the moment, we're really proud to be able to bring you cultural programs like these that you can enjoy from the comfort of your living room. And Clark, Lovell and Stacy, we would love to have you back 
to oh, discover new you. films and series when they're ready. I sure. can't wait for the sex life talk. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait for the show. I can't wait. That, that might be one of the most highly rated films. <laughs> yeah. I will we'll say, get, I have, we'll get a bigger Zoom account for that one. I have read the pilot, and the pilot is exceptional. Stacy has oh. outdone herself. It is a phenomenal show. That's I am so that, excited yeah. to see that. And, and we'd love to have the three of you back again. Everyone, again, thank you for joining us. Please stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you all for participating tonight. This was really amazing. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, hey, thank you so Wendy much. And Clark, Stacy, and Lovell, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Our Robert. pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.